If you've still got your Bible open at uh, whatever is the appropriate page for you, uh, we're going to be looking at Psalm 130, the first verse of which says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. And for that reason, probably since around about the 6th century, um, Psalm 130 has been included in a little group of psalms that are generally known as the penitential psalms. Um, Psalm 6, 32, 38, 51, 102, and 143, uh, and 130 being the, the seventh of them. One of the commentators, a, a man by the name of Miller, um, observes that these psalms express deeply and profoundly the thoughts, experiences, and feelings of the penitent sinners who cry out in anguish at the realization of their unrighteousness before the righteous God, but who at the same time know their only hope is in the grace and mercy of that same righteous God. And there is a, a kind of a balance there. I hadn't intended using this illustration, but it just popped into my brain. Um, we, we had a, a youngster who uh, came along to the church and, and was converted, uh, and her mother uh, was a school teacher, and her mother, in fact, was her school teacher. Uh, and her, her name was Mrs. Wilton. She taught our children as well, and she was a, she was a lovely woman. Uh, and on this particular occasion, in one of the little village schools just outside of Wem, um, her daughter had been less than she should have been at school. And so she was given a row by her mum. She was then popped in the back of the car, sullen-faced, to drive home. She drove home. They were a farming family. They drove into the farmyard. Uh, she opened the, the back door to let her child out, and her daughter rushed up to her, grabbed her around the leg and said, Mummy, Mummy, that Mrs. Wilton was horrible to me in school today. Uh, and and she, she'd made this transition from seeing her teacher, who had given her a row, um, to, to sort of coming to her mother, who was the only place she knew to go to be comforted. So Mrs. Wilton had been unkind to her, but Mum would kiss it better. And there is a sense in which there's something of that going on in these psalms, isn't there? David is, is saying that um, he is, if I turn the page back, it would help. Um, the, the psalmist is saying, out of the depths, Lord, I cried to you. And out of those depths, he finds comfort and solace. Verse 3 makes it fairly clear, I think, that um, the depths into which he has sunk are connected to his iniquities. It's, it's a result, not just of, of maybe um, circumstances, but uh, the psalmist sees it as a result of his iniquities. He's done something that has brought him low before God. Uh, and as he's, he's seeking his God, he finds himself right in the depths almost of despair. But he also has this deep understanding that God is there to be turned to, to be found in these times of difficulties. I think it's what David is articulating in Psalm 69. He says, I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I've come into deep waters. The flood sweeps over me. He feels that, that he is absolutely lost. A little later in the same psalm, Psalm 69, he says, Deliver me from the sinking mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies, from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. And the, the psalmists are not the only ones, are they, to... Uh, experience that sense of, of desolation. Maybe there are some of you here tonight, I, I don't know many of you well at all, so I, I, I may be putting my finger on something I, I may not be, but um, a lot of believers even do go through periods 
uh, of, of very difficult searching, and um, it, it's almost as if the heavens have become like brass, uh, and they, they cannot find their way to God. They're sinking deeper and deeper into the mire. John Bunyan describes it in his wonderful picture of Doubting Castle, and he says it was a very dark dungeon, nasty and stinking to the spirit, uh, and that's where he and his companion lay from Wednesday morning till Saturday night, he says, without one bit of bread or drink of water or light. Finally, having reduced them to miserable depression, giant despair, who was the, the owner of Doubting Castle, left a knife, a rope, and poison in their cell, and the two men are sorely tempted to end their lives. They'd reached a point where they did not know quite where to go. How do you react if that's how the world feels to you? How do you react if you feel you're sinking in the mire? In a typically Spurgeonic way, Spurgeon says this, um, there's no prison so awful as that which is built by despair and kept under a crushed spirit. Um, later on in, in a different message, he says, the world, let me just find the actual quotation. I've, the, bear with me. I'm putting it, I'll leave it. I'll, I'll come back to it. There, there's, a, there's another thing that he says that's pertinent, but I'll, I'll come to that in, in a moment. Uh, the scripture makes it clear to us, doesn't it, that um, there is a path for believers to follow, uh, and, and the psalmist understands it uh, and uncovers it here. But the first thing we need to get out of our minds is, is that this is uh, an unacceptable situation to be in. David, the psalmist here in Psalm 130, uh, Job, Naomi, in the story of Ruth, you remember when she comes back with, with Ruth, uh, and they say, hi, Naomi, lovely to see you again. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, call me bitterness, for the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Uh, and you think, whoa. But that's how she's feeling at that moment, and there are, are a host of others. Uh, and it's because the Lord very graciously has already alerted us to the fact that in our Christian walk, we will encounter a whole variety of trials and difficulties. James says, trials of various kinds. Peter says, various trials. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy says, when you're in tribulation. But John 16, 33 is perhaps the, the most useful to go to. Jesus is speaking, and he says, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Take heart. I've overcome the world. Uh, and that's the balance, isn't it? Uh, in the world we will have difficulties, but we can rejoice because we have a God that uh, is described in, in Psalm 130, uh, as the Lord who, with whom there is forgiveness, a Lord is to be feared, uh, and many other things that we'll come to in a moment. But this has been the experience of God's people all along. Jonah, in, in the belly of the fish, uh, chapter 2 of the book of Jonah begins with these words, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord, out of my distress he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows have passed over me. And that's sometimes how we can feel. But Jonah says, in that circumstance, in that situation, that was when I called to you. There is a, a kind of fundamental um, issue here. The, the psalmist is seeking mercy. He's desperately trying to avoid what he knows he richly deserves, uh, namely the, the condemnation of God. Um, he says, so, Lord, if you should mark iniquities, who would stand? 
He's, he's saying, in fact, to God, Lord, if you were to remember all the things that I've done or all the things that the people around me have done, there's not one of us that would be left standing. We'd all be destroyed. We'd be wiped out in a moment. There would be no hope for us. But he says, but there is forgiveness with you. You, you can almost sense his, his wonder and amazement of this. He knows who he is. He knows what humanity is, but, but here he's faced with a God who forgives. What kind of God is this? John Calvin says, the only haven for safety is in the mercy of God as manifested in Christ, in whom every part of our salvation is complete. We can go to this God. There's an interesting little story um, of um, surrounding uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, he had just sentenced one of his soldiers to death. Uh, and the, the soldier's son, um, sorry, the soldier's mother presented herself before the emperor. Uh, and she begged for a pardon for her son. The emperor retorted that it was the man's second offense and that justice demanded his death. Now, this, this woman was cute. She, she, was, she was on the ball. She said, I'm not asking for justice. She said, I'm pleading for mercy. Ha, said the emperor. Why do you think he deserves mercy? Sir, she cried, it wouldn't be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is what I'm begging for. And apparently the emperor paused, thought about it for a moment, and turning on his heel said, then I shall show mercy, and walked away. And the man was promptly pardoned. But, but what, a, what an astute answer. If he deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. And, and, and that's, the, that's the joy for us, isn't it? Because we, we no longer need to, to come to God in such a way that we think we've earned anything from him. We're, we're in the position that the prodigal was in. Uh, he rehearses his speech, doesn't he? As he travels along the road, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. It, it seems to me from the way the story is narrated, he never gets to deliver his speech. He's been over it a thousand times on this journey from the far country. He's got it word perfect. He, he's practiced. He knows exactly what to say. But he never gets a chance to do it because his iniquity is pardoned by his father. Iniquities are perversities, depravities, guilt contracted by sinning. That's why in verse 3, the psalmist says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? If God were to keep a ledger of our misdeeds, we would be lost forever. Not a single one of us would be able to stand before him. It's a terrifying thought, isn't it? And um, it's maybe played out most, most fully if you look at the, the, the book of Revelation uh, and you begin to see what is um, taking place there. Uh, you have all of humanity gathered before the, the throne of God. Uh, and interestingly, there's a recurrent theme which is bracketed. We were talking this morning about how the, the passage is bracketed by the, the two statements. Uh, and here are some bracketed statements in the book of Revelation. It starts in Revelation 3, 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never, this is God's promise, I will never blot his name out of the book of life. And then come a sequence of warnings. Those whose names have not been written in the book of life before the foundation, or before the foundation of the world, before the Lamb was slain, their doom is being spoken of. In 17.8, again, it's, and those who have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it is and was and was to come. Revelation 20.15, Fifteen, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, chapter after chapter of warning, uh, and then it returns to the place it began in 21.7, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, 
but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So th this whole drama of the, the judgment of humanity spread out over these latter chapters of the, the book of Revelation with all the fearful judgments and the, the terrible consequences of sin. They're, they're all bracketed by a reminder at the beginning and a reminder at the end that there is an escape route. There is a way to come to the God who forgives, who does not mark iniquities. Uh, and it is because he will inscribe in his book of life, the Lamb's book of life, Christ's book of life, the names of those who are his children. Believers can have this confidence that is being spoken about here. But that still possibly leaves us in a feeling of, of despondency and guilt and so on. So the psalmist goes on, he says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word, I do hope. So he's not promising us a, a, an immediate kind of deliverance out of any depression that we may find ourselves in. But he's giving us counsel, and he's giving us a promise. He says that we must wait, but we must wait in confidence. We must wait with an assurance that God's word is true, and so it's into the Word of God that we, we plunge ourselves to look for comfort and for strength. This was the Spurgeon quote I was looking for a moment ago. Um, Spurgeon says, grin and bear it was the old-fashioned advice. Sing and bear it is a much better deal. But I think Packer uh, maybe is, is a little more helpful. Um, he says, patience does not just grin and bear things, stoic-like but accept, accepts them cheerfully, and then these are his words, as therapeutic workouts planned by a heavenly trainer who is resolved to get you up to full fitness. That's a way of seeing and understanding difficulties and trials and temptations, isn't it? This is a therapeutic workout. Now, a glance at me will probably tell you that I am not an expert on workouts. Um, I have not had many of them in my life, and I hope to continue in the same pattern. Um, I have never quite understood the, the joy of a gym um, or, or pounding the streets. Um, no, nope, that's just not me. If it's other people, the Lord bless you. Um, I just hope it doesn't ever become compulsory. Um, but but here's, here's a spiritual workout that... The Lord, I mean, the, the whole point of a workout, I do understand it, it, it is that an, an athlete maybe needs to be trained and, and it needs to be done gradually and it's all done with a purpose and they spend so long on this machine in the, the gyms and so long on that machine. You don't spend all your time on the rowing machine. You need to be on the weights and you need to be doing this. And I've watched people do this. I know what I'm talking about. I haven't participated, but I've watched. And you can see them doing that. And they'll maybe have a dedicated trainer or a personal trainer who knows what he wants to achieve. And because the individual involved is willing to, to wait and go through this whole process of training, he knows that in the end, if this was maybe a, a professional uh, rugby player or something, that they will be at peak fitness for the game that they need to be involved in. Uh, and that's that's what... Packer is saying to us here, he's saying, God is using all the difficulties in our lives in the way that a trainer would use it, and for the same reasons, it's a therapeutic, it's a good thing. It may cause you pain, your muscles may ache the following day, and so on, but it's good. It's good. Without pain, there's no gain. Um, but it's planned by the heavenly trainer, by the Lord Jesus himself, and it is his resolve to get you to full fitness. Jacob, when he's blessing his son Dan, says, I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Isaiah knew all about waiting, didn't he? Waiting in hope uh, when the hand of God seemed to be heavy on his people. Isaiah eight seventeen. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. 
As far as Isaiah is concerned, God has turned aside. He's, he's not looking um, on Israel with favor and with blessing. But Isaiah knows that, that, that the Lord's relationship, his covenant relationship to his people will mean that if he waits, God will turn back to his people because that's his nature, that's his promise. In Isaiah 40, 31, he says this, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Is there one of us that hasn't quoted that at some point in our lives? Uh, and it's a glorious promise, isn't it? If we wait on the Lord, then, then we will find ourselves. But we, we need to grasp, don't we? What, do we? what do we mean by waiting? There's all kinds of waiting, aren't there? Um, you can wait on a wet, windy day on an exposed bus stop, absolutely hoping that the next bus hasn't been cancelled like the last one was. That's a kind of despairing hope, isn't it? That's wishful thinking. But there are times as well when we, we have such a certainty that something good is going to happen and we're just waiting for it. We're waiting for it expectantly. We're waiting for it with encouragement in our hearts. What can that be based on? Well, the psalmist says, it's the Lord. It's you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Right the way through that psalm, it's Lord, Lord, Lord. Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord, there is mercy. And always, the psalmist is directing us towards the character and the nature of God. We could spend hours together now just thinking about that the character and nature of God let's just pick up on one thing that's said in Psalm 130 in verse 7 O Israel hope in the Lord for with the Lord there is steadfast love steadfast love one of the most devastating things I can possibly imagine um, uh, and for some people this is a past experience, would be somebody in a marriage just turning and saying, I'm sorry, I don't love you anymore. Can you imagine a universe in which it was possible for God to turn to us and say, I don't love you anymore? He challenges this, doesn't he? So, you know, can, a, can a mother forsake the, the child that she bore? And he says, yes, she can. But I, the Lord, will not forsake you. Uh, and this, this steadfast nature of God's love, it, it's there throughout the psalm, Psalm 33, uh, Psalm 107, Psalm 89. The steadfast love of the Lord will endure forever is one of the repeated themes through Scripture. He's a God of steadfast love, unshakable, unmoving. He, he doesn't blow with the wind. His love is a rock upon which you can build your life. Secondly, his promises. His promises. And one of the things that is promised in this, with him is abundant redemption. With him is abundant redemption. The, the picture, I'm sure you know, of, of redemption is probably taken from the slave market. Uh, a slave uh, has no rights at all in life. He can be bought, he can be sold, he can be beaten, he can be killed. Um, but if someone were to come and redeem him, if someone could find the necessary price to set him free, his whole life would change. Uh, and God is seen as a redeemer. We'll see uh, just a couple of examples of this in a moment. But what do we read in Scripture? Proverbs 23 tells us, our redeemer is strong. Romans, Paul tells us, redemption is through Christ. Christ has redeemed us from the law. We have redemption through his blood. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The, the things are, are closely linked together. And the writer to the Hebrews says, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. Christ has set us free from the bondage and the slavery to sin. He set us free from all the things that bring us into those dark places uh, that the, the psalmist speaks about. Uh, and he's done it in a way 
that it cannot be undone for the whole of eternity. It is an eternal redemption. Augustine had something interesting to say on this. He said, no one is redeemed except through unmerited mercy. And no one is condemned except through merited judgment. That's what we seek for, isn't it? And that's what, if you're a Christian, you have already found this evening. Unmerited mercy. You remember the little story about Napoleon? If it was deserved mercy, it wouldn't be mercy. That's what God has given us. We didn't deserve it, but the Lord has given us. Isaac Watts in his hymn says this, Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. But Christ, the heavenly Lamb, takes all our sins away, a sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. There are two great passages, I think. The, the one is so familiar, I'll just mention it and, uh, and not elaborate on it at all, is the, 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 ex, the exodus from Egypt and, and its link with the, the blood on the doorposts and the lintels and so on. Uh, and that is classed in, in Scripture as redemption. Here's the second one. Easier to miss. Hosea and his wife. The Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lectech of barley. What a, there are some interesting things that God calls upon his prophets to, to do. Jeremiah is to remain single all his life. Hosea is to have a chaotic married life, which allows his wife to become an adulteress and then requires him to go and, and with all the shame that would be involved in it, to buy her, presumably off a slave box where she's ended because of her immoral life. Uh, and he buys her back and takes her again to be his wife. And Ezekiel, who is told there is a way, Ezekiel, that you can demonstrate how my heart is towards the, uh, the sin of my people and towards the judgment that is going to fall upon them and upon Jerusalem. He, he just said to Ezekiel, the Lord said, I'm going to take away the light of your eyes. And it says the next morning, my wife died. Don't weep. Don't cry. A broken-hearted man who must stand and say, yeah, but look at what's going to happen to Jerusalem. Look at what is happening because God's people have turned away from God. But Hosea's little part of that, that trilogy of, of kind of marriage uh, requirements from, from the Lord to his prophets it is this woman who is redeemed, redeemed at a price. And, and the price is not really so much the 15 shekels of silver, the homer and a lectic of barley. It, it's it's the, the social cost to Hosea. He would have been a laughing stock already amongst people because of her conduct. Now he's going to be regarded as an utter fool because he's going to embrace her again. But nothing compares, does it, with the, the price that our Lord Jesus Christ was prepared to pay for us. Nothing, nothing compares with what is uh, just portrayed for us, visualized for us uh, around the Lord's table uh, as we remember that he came uh, and died the most shameful death imaginable, that you and I might understand that with God, there is deliverance, that God is not a God who simply keeps a record of wrongs, but a God who is willing to write in another ledger, the, the ledger of the Lamb's Book of Life, and stand by that inscription for all time and all eternity. And so we wait for the Lord.
not waiting in a bored kind of way, not waiting in a, in a kind of, um, well, it'll happen when it'll happen way. No, that, that's not what's said. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, he says, more than those who watch for the morning. I, I suspect what he has in mind there is the watchman who, when the morning came at last, his shift would be over and he could come out of the tower and he could go home again. Um, but probably all of us have experienced those sleepless nights, you know, when the clock moves at a snail's pace across the face, you know, and you think, it can't still be only one o'clock, you know, and, and, and you're so uncomfortable, maybe you're in pain, you're, you're so disgruntled by what's going on you, you, you're and you're longing longing for the morning or maybe it's a much happier picture maybe the the morning is the morning of, of your marriage uh, and you're waiting and, and you know all the time that's been spent all the preparations are done and now at last it's gonna happen those that wait for the morning wait for all sorts of reasons but they wait expectantly and they wait confidently, and they wait with joy in their hearts very often, because the morning is what they've been longing for and waiting for. And we have a morning to wait for, don't we? We have a morning uh, that we're looking forward to when the Lord Jesus Christ will come again, when, when God has outlined for John in, in the book of Revelation all of the the things that will, will come to pass. And he shows him in the end that, that vision of the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, and John is a prisoner on the island of Patmos for the sake of the gospel. Um, he's already seen all of his fellow apostles die, most of them difficult deaths. Uh, and, and he sees the church in the midst of persecution. Then he sees the promise of the future, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Uh, and what does he say? Come, Lord Jesus. He's waiting for the morning, for the dawn of the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, and that's what God calls us to, isn't it? In, in this present world, uh, the likelihood is that we will grow older, uh, we will grow weaker, and we will gain a few aches and pains along the way. But that's not the end. That's just a phase through which we will go. The end is what is promised to us in God, an eternity in his presence free from sin, free from sickness, free from sorrow, free from death, free from crying, free from tears, at home, at last, with our God.